Hello everybody, this is James dealing with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check, so if you can hear my voice, please type in Y. Please type in Y if my voice is coming through, and as soon as we have confirmation on audiovisual, we'll get the session started. Hey Peter, good to see you. Uh, Scott, Michael, Ronnie, Lane, fantastic. Looks like we're good to go loud and clear. Uh, just want to thank you ladies and gentlemen for your time in advance. Uh, today we're going to do a price action session with a specific focus on the recent breakout in the US dollar. Uh, U.S. dollars popped higher over the last couple of weeks as we've had some rather hawkish Fed rhetoric, and that's led to flows into USD, giving us this topside breakout. The big question is whether or not this has staying power. I want to look at a few different currency pairs that might be setting up around that theme. Uh, and then, of course, I'm going to leave about 20 minutes towards the end of the session for questions and answers, so please feel free to type in any questions you might have. Anything trading-related, I'll do my absolute best to address that towards the end of the session. Now, before we get to the chart, I need to go through a couple of quick risk disclaimers. I'm going to leave each one up for about 15 seconds, and then we'll get right to the chart. We'll get right into the meat of the matter. And uh, as I said, any questions you have, type those in. I'll do my best to address those. Uh, before we get started, I do have one comment here from uh, ADFADFG uh, say, I don't, saying, I don't use any indicators, so I'm here to see if you can teach price action based strictly on candles and FIB levels. That's predominantly what I'm looking at, yes. Uh, price action... A lot of Fibonacci, a lot of just standardized support and resistance, psychological levels, things of that nature. Uh, but as far as the usage of indicators, I will not have any of those on my charts here. So let's get to risk disclaimer part one. And here we go. Uh, like I said, I'm going to leave this up for about 15 seconds. Trading is risky. You need to be well aware of that. I'm literally watching the seconds crawl behind the clock. Let me try that 15 seconds there for you. All right, now uh, disclaimer part two. Hypothetical trading disclaimer. We're going to look at some past trades. We're going to look at some strategy. Anytime we do that, we have to know past performance is not indicative of future results. I'm going to give this about another five seconds, and then we'll be ready to move on. And boom, ready to go. All right, so I mentioned the breakout in USD. This is what I'm talking about. So there's been really a couple of different types of breakouts here. Uh, first, let me dial back to look at a really long-term trend line here. Now, this is a trend line that may have something usable on an intra-month, intraday basis, but I have to dial all the way back to 1992 to find the point of origination. There's a touch point right here. What makes this really interesting to me, though, is the intra-month price action we saw around the projection of that trend line. Give me the idea that maybe it's still getting some element or some type of play. Notice since we had this run in March of 2015, when the dollar popped up into this current vicinity that we're trading in. Let's see those intra-month inflections. It's right here, the less bolded line. And you can see where it had some decent inflection points. Right, it's not great, but we're here extrapolating a monthly long-term trend line onto a daily chart, so it's rarely going to be very pretty. Um, but what is more interesting to me is the fact that price action has been unable to, to really divorce away from this trend line, i.e. giving us that further gain, that run, similar to what we had back in 1998 leading into the tech boom, which eventually became the tech bust, uh, or an inflection off that trend line driven by a weaker dollar. We haven't seen either of those. Price action has just been hanging around here for about 19 months now. And we know why that is, right? And the Fed's been bantering around rate hikes, hawkish, dovish, etc. Now, the recent breakout that we've seen really kicks off around the beginning of October. This is as some of that super hawkish Fed rhetoric has come in. And when I say super hawkish, what I'm referring to is it appears as though within the Fed there's a growing chorus talking about the risks around low rates. And this is something we've talked about a lot over the past year or so. But it appears as though the Fed, or at least some members on the Fed, are beginning to shift into this mode where they're not of the mind that low rates are a panacea any longer where low rates may actually be bringing on more risk than slow and incremental rate hikes. Um, this was something that Ms. Yellen alluded to in December when the Fed finally kicked rates higher. This was something that ha has been an intermittent type of theme throughout this year. Uh, most recently, we heard Ms. Mester take a fairly hardened stance 
on this, and then we heard Mr. Fisher discuss it yesterday. So there's a legitimate case to be made for a continued topside breakout here in USD on the back of either A, shifting Fed policy, which alludes to the fact that the Fed may be wanting to hike rates slowly, incrementally, in the effort of staging off some of that recessionary risk that could be brought upon by low rates. Or the second, uh, the primary, uh, or what has been the primary this year, is that a growing chorus on the Fed just wants to raise rates to get off of emergency-like policy. So there's a couple of different factors here that could continue to drive flows into USD on the back of higher rate expectations as we near November and the December FOMC meeting. So here's that October breakout right here. The first break that we had was outside of the symmetrical wedge with a decent topside trend line that had a couple of different points of touch. Now, what was really interesting here is if you remember that flash crash that we had in cable, that's what gave us this gap here on DXY. Now, if you remember that long dated trend line that I was talking about, the, the thin one here, we had some ride back in July. But when that flash crash in the cable came out, where do you think the US dollar gapped up to? Resisted, came right back down, found support off the projection of the trend line, and has continued that top side break higher. So now we're trading at levels where we got up to levels that we hadn't seen since like March, March 10th to be exact. That was when the Fed um, kicked back that four rate hikes in 2016 expectation. So we've gotten back into that rich area on the chart. Now since, prices have whittled back down and we're catching support right around that area of old resistance, those July highs. Perhaps more to the point, let's go down on like a four hour chart. There you go. You can see where we've had a couple of different tests down into the support zone. Buyers have responded, they've come back in. So this just furthers the case that that top side USD move may have some legitimate staying power. We come down right here on an hourly chart. Notice we have a decent little trend line using this point of origination 10, 11, 1900. Point of connection right here 10, 13, 2100. Project that on. Notice we got a nice little hit earlier this morning 0600. And again, just furthers the case that we could have continuation in the top side USD move. Now, from that sector, this could denominate a, a litany of different ways to play that theme. Uh, I got a few setups in currency land that I'm looking at. Uh, also have some uh, going over into equity markets. I don't know if I have time for the equity market setups today. If there's anything specific you want to look at, fire my way. I'll be happy to take a look when we get to Q&A. Uh, but the first setup that I wanted to look at is here in dollar CAD. Now, dollar CAD is a pair that I've been pretty passive with of late. We've been in this upper sloping channel, which to me looks like a fairly standard bear flag formation, right? We have this downward move, aggressive downward move. Since then, we've been channeling higher. It looked like we had a couple of break points, hasn't come to fruition yet. And now we're catching some support here off the midline of that channel. Now, it's, it's what's underneath these support points that is more interesting to me. And that's the big figure at 130, and the Fibonacci level that we have just about 15 pips below that big figure. So let's get that big figure on the chart. All right at 130 flat. I need to differentiate this too. There we go. So we have what could be a basis of, of support down here that I could possibly use for a top side continuation play. Now the motivation behind this one is, is the Bank of Canada. We have a BOC rate decision tomorrow morning. And BOC policy stance has very much been a, a driver here in dollar cat of recent. So if you remember back to last year, Bank of Canada, really very dovish. Really very dovish. We had an extremely weak Canadian dollar leading into the beginning of this year. And that led to something like, uh, if you guys remember the Canadian cauliflower crisis, which uh, I'm, I'm at this point suspecting that the history books will look at similar to the Marmite crisis in the UK, which was a really weak Canadian dollar with a stronger US dollar meant that the uh, import of product like cauliflower was like 15 bucks a head in Canada, whereas traditionally it's like a couple of dollars. Just a massive increase in prices just on the back of a currency exchange. There was also a supply issue behind that, but 
that wasn't something that's going to be immediately um, visible in front of most people. Instead, they're going to look at the currency. They're going to say, well, there's the banes of inflation. Well, what happened at the beginning of the year was really very interesting. Uh, Mr. Justin Trudeau had recently taken over as PM, uh, uh, Prime Minister of Canada. And head of the BOC, Stephen Polos, essentially alluded to the fact that the bank was going to take a step back from monetary stimulus in order to allow Mr. Trudeau to embark on fiscal stimulus measures. And that's what helped to create this really strong run of Canadian dollar strength. As this thing put in an aggressive move, about 2,000 pips, a little over 2,000 pips, in like five months. Not even five months, about four months. Now, once we got down there, it didn't look as though, or at least the initial signs of Mr. Trudeau's efforts, haven't really shown much fruit, at least yet. And so there's been a growing course of concern that the BOC is going to have to jump back in here to do more monetary, uh, even, I don't even want to go as far as stimulus, but monetary dovishness in order to weaken the currency to help out exports. So that's what could help explain this rising channel. Now we have that BOC rate decision tomorrow. The big question is whether or not we're at that pivot point where the BOC says, you know what, we're going to need to do a little bit more here. Maybe it happens tomorrow, maybe it happens a month from now, maybe it happens Q1 of 2017. But it feels as though something like that is inevitably going to happen, and this could open the door where we have that divergence between representative policies from these central banks. U.S. dollar getting stronger as the Fed's getting more hawkish, Canadian dollar getting weaker as the BOC is getting more dovish. Could open the door to a extended trendside run type of move. But even if it doesn't, I could trade this within the channel, line this up for a 1-2 risk reward ratio. If I'm going to look to get that stop at about 29 and 3 quarters to get underneath this FIB level at 29.86, it's going to be about 132 pips of risk uh, with current market prices, which isn't great. I'm not a huge fan of taking on 130 pips of risk going into a central bank meeting, but there could be some attractive upside there that could offer a better than 1-to-1 risk reward. The first area that I'd want to look to take profits is like right here. You see this little price action inflection that we had off this FIB level at 33.12. I don't want to get too greedy up there because notice that we had a failure high before this thing reversed. Right here, we couldn't quite get up there. So I'm going to be a little bit, a little bit more conservative in my profit target, trying to take it on the inside of these wicks. Like right there, like a 32.80 could be a pretty comfortable zone. Um, now, if I get 32.80, that opens up about 170 pips of possible upside for me, right? Which, if I'm taking on like 130 pips of risk, 170 upside, better than a one-to-one. -one. Um, the real prize here isn't in just the channel. It's As I was alluding to earlier, it's looking for that extended break as we get divergence between these two monetary policies. Maybe that happens tomorrow, maybe it doesn't, but tomorrow is that pivot where something is likely going to move. And I like the fact that I could get a better than one-to-one -one just trading within this channel. So that's the first setup I wanted to look at for this uh, for today in the effort of dollar strength continuation. Okay, this is going to be a little bit more of a straight swing setup, and that's in the Kiwi dollar. Um, Kiwi dollars rallied up to a really interesting level of resistance to me today, which is why I'd call this more of a swing setup. Uh, on a longer term basis, I'm much more attracted to a long position off that 69.50 to 70 zone. And if you remember going back for a couple of weeks, this is the zone I've been looking for. Uh, we just didn't get it. Notice the swing came just like 35 pips or so uh, from the top end of that support zone, and it put in a rather vigorous bounce. Now this one, to me, seems a little bit more divorced of, of domestic monetary policy out of New Zealand. And, you know, case in point, we've had a, a rate cut and then more dovish language over the past couple of months, and yet this thing has still continued to go up. It wasn't until we started to get that really hawkish commentary out of the Fed, that the pair really started to tumble. So to me, this still feels kind of like a high beta type of issue if, if the primary source is interest rate differentials, right? As in, if the Fed's looking very dovish, if dollar weakness is all the rage, then the Kiwi is going to put in a little bit more strength to go along with that theme, or at least that's what's appeared. Uh, on the flip side of that, when we do get a strong dollar on the back of hawkish Fed commentary, it's appeared as though the Kiwi's been a little bit weaker than most other currencies. As evidenced by the support break around that Fonsi hawkishness at the beginning of October. 
So if that FOMC hawkishness is going to continue, if that USD topside breakout is going to continue, this to me feels like what could be a pretty interesting way to look for a continuation move of that theme. Now, this is going to be a little more difficult to set up because we do have that support down here at around 70. I'm going to call this 69.50 to 70. I'm just going to do like a 50 pip, kind of like a chunky zone in there. All right, so that's like top end profit target for me at this stage. Um, now, when I get something like this, and this is just you know from a pure trading setup. When I get something like this, the only real option I have to look for additional top end is to do like a scale out strategy once we get down your support. It could be a little daunting, but what I mean by that is either I'm going to take like two pieces on the way down and then take off a third piece here, leaving a fourth piece on, so breaking a lot up in quarters. That allowed me to get my stop down to break even, maybe break even plus. And that way I could risk the remainder of that size, remainder of that distance, for an additional run. Now, if that additional run doesn't take place, well, then I'm out at break even, or slightly in the money. But when we have a support level that's been pretty well tested, when I am taking a counter trend position, it's absolutely something that needs to be taken into account. Right? Now, this is the level that makes this an interesting play. Now, so let me show you where the Fibonacci retracement came from. Uh, just real simple. We're taking the top from July of 2014 and taking it down to this bottom in August of 2015. Now, this Fib retracement's shown quite a bit of price action. All right, we've seen quite a few inflections at these levels. Like most standard Fibonacci retracements, it's not perfect. But notice the way the support had worked here. This is recently as like August, uh, throughout August. We had to work in his resistance coming into the month. Some support there in August. So right now price action, you can see where this wick is just kind of like cutting right there at the level. Let's go down a little tighter. All right, so you see how we now have two consecutive candles on this four hour chart showing wicks right here off 7205, right off that FIB level. Let's go down a little tighter. There we go. You can even see where resistance is trying to push this thing lower right now. It just hasn't worked yet, right? Uh, it looked like it was going to take away, but buyers came in. We were able to push it right back above. So this resistance, for now, is not ready to, is not ready to act on. What I want to see is I want to see prices actually breaking down. Right, so we have this little swing point. I'm all the way down on like a five minute chart now. I have this little swing point at like 91, uh, 71.97. It's about eight pips away. And then I have this swing point right here, 71.82. Right, I want to see those lows broken before I have the idea that this resistance, that this resistance may hold. Okay? Now, if I could get that in the next couple hours of, of the day, then that could open up a setup where I could put a stop above the high and then look for that resistance to hold for price action to move lower. So again, if we do get a continuation of this dollar strength theme, fantastic. But if we don't, get me out really, relatively quick because I don't want to be on the wrong side of this thing, at least for too long. Um, now on the profit target side, like I was saying, I want to be a little more strategic than just putting a limit out there at 70 and hoping that it hits. Instead, we could look at this recent price action inflection. There's been a couple. Right, we had a little support dig right down here at about 70 spot 80. And then a little bit deeper here, about 70, 35. Right, I could look at either of these as an initial target on the position. And then if I get that initial target, like I was saying earlier, move the stock down to break even or break even plus, and then look for the bigger move down to like that 70 flat. And then if we get down to 70 flat, I could look to take off another piece of the lot and then look for a continuation below. Uh, so that's the second long dollar setup that I have for this week against the Kiwi. Um, another one, dollar yen. Uh, this one is still on my radar. <clears throat> uh, okay, so before we get to that, uh, Will has a really good question here. I think it's a good point of emphasis that, uh, that other folks might be wondering about. Will asks, uh, can you repeat that again? You want to see lower lows on the five minute chart for confirmation of the price moving lower. So the way that I look at this, Will, is is that this four-hour chart of the Kiwi dollar is pretty much the same thing as this one-minute chart. The one difference is granularity uh, and more detail, right? You know, imagine it like trying to buy a car, right? 
the monthly view is kind of like just looking at that car on the internet, right? Going through the you know whole build your own model kind of deal, right? It's cool, it gives you some information, but it's not going to give you that real close view, right? The one minute chart is kind of like sitting in the driver's seat. It feels good, but doesn't make sense. Is the gas mileage where you want it? Is, is it is it safe enough for a family car or whatever, right? Now, when you're buying a car, you should do both. You should do your online research. You should go and set in it, you know, make sure that it's what you want. You should walk around, kick the tires. So to me, time frames are very much uh, very similar to that, right? Where the monthly chart, it gives me a lot of information. It's just not necessarily directly usable to me right now. Right? It could take months for these themes to play out, whereas like the five-minute chart, it's pretty usable, right? But it's, it completely loses sight of the bigger picture. So I use, try to use all of these. Uh, well, I, well, uh, I have a kind of a, a system set that I use. Mine's pretty simple. I want to be aware of what's going on on the monthly. I look at the weekly fairly regularly. The daily is really where it's at for me. Then the four-hour one hour, and if I want to get really tight with things, five minutes about as, 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 as tight as I'll go. So if I want to trade, say, resistance on this daily chart, right, it would make sense that I want to see near-term momentum pointing lower before I'm going to look to get that short position, right? Because all that I know at this point is the price ran up to a level that could be interesting. If I go down to the hourly chart, and I see that this thing is beginning to break down, well, then I could posit that that long-term level of resistance that I'm watching is resisting and that short-term momentum is moving lower in concert of what could be a bigger picture or a longer term turn. So the way that I'm going to look to trade this level of resistance, because all that I know right now is that we're at an interesting level on the Kiwi. I don't know that this resistance is going to hold. One way that I could confirm it is going down to like the five minute chart waiting for this thing to turn over. Notice this thing has been really very bullish since we had that last support hit at 7080. But I could let this thing turn over to get the idea, okay, well, at least short-term momentum is beginning to head lower. I get a stop above that longer-term high. If that short-term move develops into something bigger, fantastic. Then I can move that stop down into the money or that break even, scale out of the position. But if it doesn't, if price action just continues to run higher, way beyond resistance, then I never get in the short position. Just a way of trying to, I guess the best analogy that I've ever heard is, um, you know, trying to make decisions for the world by seeing through a keyhole, right? Because in reality, that's all the markets are. We get a keyhole of vision where we can only see a portion of what's actually going on. Uh, but if we can line that up so that we get a decent view into the room, then that could give us enough information to be able to make decisions off of. The way I try to look at things. Markets are pretty chaotic in general, you know, um, and and this is something that I run into a lot because you know I talk about fundies, I talk about techs. The way I look at it is, if, if it can move price, I want to get, I want to get to know it, you know. Um, but I'm very much of the belief that for a trader to be successful in this game, <laughs> they got to first learn how to lose properly. So that's why a lot of what I talk about dives right back to risk management, looking for these little angles or these little wedges, resistance hits, etc. Uh, Will says that was great. Thank you. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, all right, back to dollar yen. Um, so this one on a macro front is the one that I'm, and if you guys have watched my stuff, you know, this is probably one of the ones I'm more excited about. And the reason for that is because of what happened here between 2012 and 2015. I don't think that Japan's done yet. I think that the same, I don't want to use this word, but it's what it is, the same desperation that led into Abinomics in the first place, I believe that still exists, maybe even with a greater risk factor now with the state of China. Because that's really what the differentiator in this chart is, right? Abinomics kicked off Q4 of 2012. It was a, it was a game-changing type of thing for the yen. Just a few years later, the yen is like 50% cheaper. If you're a Japanese exporter, this is just like the greatest thing ever, right? Um, you know, I always use the car example, so let's go, let's go back to that. Um, you know, let's say that I'm, I'm making and producing a car in Japan and then I'm selling it in the United States. If I sell that car in the United States for $20,000 in 2011, I'm going to bring back about 1.5 million yen. It's just 20,000 times 75. 
Now, fast forward three years, if I'm making that same car at that same price and still selling it at that same price of $20,000 in the United States, when the dollar ends at one twenty-five, dollars well, now I'm bringing back 2.5 million yen. So I'm bringing back 1.5 million yen here in 2011, 2.5 million yen here in 2015, and I didn't even have to do anything different. I'm just making an extra million yen on every car that sold. That's the beauty of currencies, or currency weakness, rather. Now, that's great for Japan, but how do you think the GM and Ford are feeling? Because now they're losing market share to Japanese auto manufacturers. They're able to cut prices because they can afford to do so because of that weak yen. It, it exports deflation, if you will. Another topic for another day. But what happened right in here was China's Black Monday. Uh, Chinese markets began to collapse in June the world really didn't take notice until August 11th when, uh, when, when, when China changed the way that they were going to value the yuan. Before it was a fixed rate, fixed floating rate against the dollar. Here is when they decided to do it against a basket of currencies, meaning Chinese capital flows were then going to be directed into yen. And when you know it, shortly thereafter, a really strong yen came about. But this isn't something that went unknown to Japanese policymakers, right? And they saw that. They saw the benefits of what was happening when that yen was really weak and helping out Japanese exporters. Now that relationship is going in reverse. And so as that yen strengthened more and more and more, the expectation for the Bank of Japan to take on more action has just continued to increase. Now recently we've had this USD breakout. You can see that right in here, beginning of October, same kind of thing we've seen in all these other currency pairs. But this one also has the potential for a shift in a central bank policy of this currency as well. As in, if we do see this continued hawkish, fancy rhetoric driving the U.S. dollar stronger, if we do see this continued USD breakout, and then if we do eventually see the Bank of Japan make another type of move or pivot on stimulus strategy, it's another one of those situations where we could have both monetary policies pointing in the same direction. Similar to what we had in 2012 going into 2015 as the Federal Reserve, as the U.S. was coming off of QE and as Japan was going on it. And then also similar to post-August 11th of last year when Japanese yen strength was just all the rage. Now more recently, if we draw back to like the Brexit referendum, we've seen the dollar yen making a series of higher lows on a long-term chart. So we had this inflection point in June, this one here in mid-August, another test here in like last week of September. USD strength starts up. Now we've just kicked up to a new high. We broke above that prior swing high right here. And then notice that we were getting this kind of this resistance filling in. All right, let's go down a little tighter. Hourly chart, there we go. Okay, so this is, in, in my mind, is a really good example of a short-term observation of longer-term resistance coming into a market. Notice we first popped above, sellers came in. The strength wasn't done. Buyers didn't die. They pushed it higher, and sellers came in even more aggressively. We were actually able to push it lower then. Now, when it comes back here, you can see the buyers aren't as enthused because they weren't able to break it above this high or even this one. And then also of interest, sellers were ready to, short this off this resistance level, like 1432. And since then, it's been making lower highs. So what we have here on a short-term basis, really short-term basis, is like a wedge-ish type of formation. Actually, you know what? Scrap this. I'm going to start with the support line. There we go. So we have support on the shorter term chart. This is on this longer term chart. So you can picture this as like a really short term wedge, trying to decide what that longer term setup is going to do. Now at the top side, there we go. There's that shorter term wedge. And we're at support right now in the wedge. So this is another top 
topside USD candidate for me. I still like the idea of weekend. As to when, I'm, we might be looking for that next uh, BOJ move. It's anybody's guess. Um, my opinion is that what they did in September was setting them up to make a pivot in the later portion of this year, maybe even Q1 of next year. But by targeting 10-year JGB yields, this gives the Bank of Japan an incredible amount of flexibility to work on both ends of the yield curve. And I think that's something that a lot of folks have missed. Because it appeared as though, after that last BOJ meeting right here, the markets were relatively disappointed, right? Notice the yen strengthened, came right back down. This is when we got that, that next iteration of higher low support. Another test of that higher low support right here. But that was the reaction to BOJ. It was, it was largely one of yen's strength. But to me, to my eyes, what they did is, is forward planning and prepping up for a part two that may be coming about. Now this trade that I'm lining up here is significantly more short-term nature, right? I'm essentially looking to play a, you know, a couple hundred pip run. But if this can get that, that breakaway move, and in my experience, it's usually the technicals that show it first. Because if I wait until the BOJ actually announces something, that thing's going to gap, and then i got to try to catch it. And then i got the prospect of trying to buy it while it's at a high. I like the idea of trying to position it ahead of time so that if something does happen, if we do get that shift, whether it's an extreme amount of hawkishness out of the Fed, an extreme amount of dovishness out of the BOJ, I already have a position in so that if this thing runs, fantastic. If not, cut the bleeding quick. I don't want to sit here and pay to see how wrong I might have been. Right and wrong is a very relative thing. The other day as a trader, the one goal is the bottom line. That's all that matters. All right, now on that bottom line, <clears throat> uh, everything we've talked about so far is uh, long USD setups. Uh, all on the theme of that topside USD continuation. But if the last year has told us anything, is that even if you're a trader, the prospect of diversification matters. You don't want all your eggs in one basket, whether that basket is Brexit, or presidential candidates, whoever that might be, because unknown things happen all the time. And if that basket is kicked to the curb, well, as a trader, you're just out of luck. It's our job to try to stay in the middle. So my search for trying to get in the middle is looking at the fact that this thing may not have staying power. It's totally possible, right? There is one currency that looks good to me for that theme right now, and that's here in the Euro. Now, we have an ECB meeting on Thursday. Okay, so this one is not without headline risk. Wait here before we get to that. Check this out. This is pretty cool. It's another one of these longer running trend lines. And where this came about, um, you know, earlier in the year, I noticed there was like something going on here. Right, you can notice some symmetry in these in these in these lows. So to me it looked like there was a trend line somewhere. So I went digging and digging and digging. Seeing what I could find. Yeah, I'm gonna need to go back to a monthly. And sure enough, what I found um, I still consider pretty interesting, and it's right here. I'm taking this point of origination, October 2000, the point of touch uh, right here, July of 2001. And then if you project that, uh, that's where, to my eyes, the really cool part starts to happen. Because if you remember the way that the euro was trading back when European QE first was coming online, uh, you know, first couple months of 2015, the thing was dropping like a rock. It couldn't catch a bid to save its life. There was no reason to want to buy euros at this point. Every bank, almost every bank on the street, was calling for parity, like tomorrow, right, right down here. And you know, there's an important learning lesson there. When everybody's looking at one level, it probably isn't going to happen. Uh, we have the same kind of thing with 105 on cable right now, which, which I can talk about here in a second. But this thing was dropping like a rock, and then all of a sudden it just stopped. Nobody knew why. Well, there's that projected trend line down there. Maybe that was one of the reasons. We had another touch right down here. You know, kind of like we did a little earlier, we can go down on a shorter term chart. We can see where we had like these intra month bounces off this thing. There's that blood, that, that, that bleeding market that we had in the first portion of 2015. And you can see where we have, you know, these multiple support hits right in here. 
And so while looking for this trend line that I never found, I found something I think might be a little bit better right down here, like 108.50. Now, this can be helpful uh, from a couple of different sectors, primarily for stock placement at the moment. So the euro is at a point of support that we bounced off of back in July. A little bit deeper, we have the Briggs at low right here. And then right here, we have like 108.50. I want to be 20 on those lows. The projection of this, I have at about 108.50. We also have this big chunky zone right in here between 12.13 and 12.95, a couple of long-term Fib levels. And notice, since we have seen that deluge of price action going back to the first couple of months of last year, this zone has acted almost like a magnet for price action. We break away and the prices come right back. Break up, prices come right back, cut through right it's like barbed wire in there now you can see where I mean we just had like a you know a, a, a struggle between the spread here all of these wicks coming about into September open of October and notice that the euro really didn't get to moving lower until um, about a week ago right that's when this thing really began to break now, what's going to happen in ECB, I have no earthly idea. I don't think that anybody else does. Um, I had done my best to preview that yesterday. Um, give me one second. I got a, what I feel to be a pretty good article on the matter. There we go. And when I say I have no earthly idea on the matter, I just want to be brutally honest with you folks because the ECB right now I think is a little bit tougher to read because they're already pretty deep into a QE program. Now, their bond buying program is set to end in March of 2017. It appears as though they're going to extend it. More recently, there's been some questions on that extension. Um, I just put that link in the chat box for anybody who might be so interested. Oh, and if you guys want to get notified, of uh, articles that I write. You can join my distribution list right here. I only send like one email a week, so I'm not going to be spamming you guys or anything like that. Actually, let's take a step back. Let's do the full story on uh, ECBQ. We've got a couple of minutes here. Okay, so if you guys remember when this, this, this whole idea first came about, and let's go back there. When this idea first came about, we could even cut it back to 2012. Now, 2012 this is when the European financial collapse was just really raging. I mean, this is when you had uh, bond yields in Spain at like seven points, Italy at like eight points. It was not looking good for the Eurozone. It looked as though end game was in order. And we even started to hear breakup scenarios, you know, like uh, breaking the Euro into two parts. We had Northern Euro, we had the Southern Euro, and all these other ideas. And, and uh, well, all of that capitulated. In July of 2012, this is when Mario Draghi gave his whatever it takes promise, alluding to the fact that he and the European Central Bank would do whatever it takes to keep the European Union together. And that was a great thing at the time, you know, because everybody's worried about the euro breaking up. This helped allay some of those fears, some of those concerns, and it led to a nice, consistent, steady streak of wins for the euro that lasted for a couple of years. Now, there's one problem. No, well, first off, you guys know why this was happening, right? The U.S. dollar is getting weaker at the time because the Treasury is, is actively printing new dollars. Um, we've already had Abenomics kick up, so we have the Bank of Japan actively weakening the yen. So if you look at these two major market forces, the U.S. and Japan, both weakening their currency simultaneously, with the euro or the ECB not doing anything um, uh, dovish or hawkish here, it just exposed the euro to capital flows. The euro strengthened. Now, that's not a good thing for Europe at, 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 at such a desperate time because that stronger euro simply meant that that relationship that we were talking about Japan a little bit earlier where exporters really enjoyed the gains of a weak yen, well, this, that situation was in reverse. Where now exporters in Europe were getting hit by a stronger euro. They're pulling back fewer euros for every unit sold simply because of a rising exchange rate. This was an untenable situation. And so in May of 2014, Mario Draghi said, we're going to do something about this. Be on the lookout. And so we come into June. Notice the euro had sold off. The euro had sold off coming into June of 2014. 
Everybody's expecting for the big bazooka to get launched. That's the ECB day in June of 2014. Notice that we ran lower. We bounced off 135, strong psychological level. And then we shot higher. Now, the reason this happened is because Mario Draghi did not unleash that bazooka. He told us it was coming here. He didn't deliver here. The euro re-strengthens. Now, he finally delivered in July. Now, in July, he rolled out the details of the program, and he said it's going to be coming online in the first quarter of 2015. You guys want to guess when that actually came in line? When it actually began to, uh, began to, uh, to actually work? It's like right here. It was the second week of March 2015, after the euro had already put in most of the move. So European QE, designed to weaken the euro, comes online here, and since then, the euro's only gained. Now, what created this? This was driven by banks and hedge funds trying to get in front of the ECB, because the ECB glaringly told everybody what they're going to do. And so every hedge fund in the world, well, I say every, many hedge funds wanted to try to front run the European Central Bank before they went out there in a massive liquidity program. Sure enough, shortly after the program starts, the euro sets a bottom, begins to bounce, and then we spent the better part of the last 20 months in range-bound like conditions. And then you notice the support point that we have right down here, right around 109.50. And this begins to build the impetus for topside positions, looking for USD weakness. Now there's a very real concern as to whether or not the Euro or the ECB even could do more QE as they're beginning to corner their own fixed income markets. Now that's also a concern in Japan, a little bit different though, because Japanese ABS asset-backed uh, securities markets are, are significantly more developed than what's in Europe. Put it otherwise, there's just more for, for Japan to buy. Than Europe. So the big question is what the ECB might do with their QE program on, on Thursday at that meeting. And given that we have support within the range, I like the idea of looking for topside play, and that's one of the few USD weakness candidates that I have right now. All right, I've went uh, way longer than I was expecting. I got one last one I wanted to touch on. Cable. I know there's a lot of folks that are looking at this one. This is kind of like the um, it's kind of like the car crash mentality, right? When there's a crash, everybody wants to look, everybody wants to see what's going on. In actuality, it's probably not doing any of us any favors. But we're at a pretty strong level right now. Right now, now, I had talked about this one yesterday. Uh, give me one second, I'm trying to get an article here that... Uh, has a little bit more behind it. All right, yeah, so I've been talking about the potential for inflation to begin showing up in the UK. And, you know, this is another one of those trade flow types of conundrums. So, the idea of hard Brexit, began to steal the headlines again around the beginning of October, leads into a Massive move here in the British pound, but to put this in scope, it had already made a massive move right down here. Now, when you get a move in a domestic currency that's so incredibly aggressive, it doesn't take long for inflation to begin showing up on imported products, right? Because again, if we dial back to that example around Japan, as the value of the yen is rising, Japanese exporters are getting crushed because they're bringing back fewer yen for every dollar sold in the United States. So what is the Japanese producer going to do? Are they just going to take the brunt of that? Probably not. They're probably going to try to offset it in some way, either by rising prices, raising prices, or by cutting their costs, one or the other. Right? At the end of the day, this is a business. It's not profitable. It doesn't exist. I don't want this for long. So in the UK, as the value of the British pound is dropping dramatically, if me, as an American exporter selling goods in the UK, does not raise my price, I am going to take a loss. Because the value of every British pound that I get 
for every unit sold is decreasing in value. So what are importers in the UK or exporters to the UK going to do? They have no choice. They have to raise prices. Now, as they raise prices, that brings import inflation or inflation on imported products. That's just the start. Eventually, we'll usually see that inflation filter in beyond imported products, unless there's, um, you know, unless it's an, an, an absolute purchasing decision type of matter where uh, a UK resident has a perfectly exchangeable good, right? Uh, Marmite's a good example. Prices of Marmite increased on the back of this really weak British pound. Well, if there was a like sample of a completely domestic UK product that had nothing imported in it, then maybe the effect isn't going to be as big, but it is because the UK imports a ton of stuff. Now, my timing on this one has not been great. I was looking for that import inflation theme to begin kicking up right back here. And if we look at this on the daily chart, notice how we have these multiple higher lows that have been building. And what's really cool about this is the fact that each one of these runs lower <clears throat> is basically sparked by the BOE. So Brexit happens right here. Sterling runs higher. And then Mark Carney says, hey, guys, rate cuts are coming. And then the Sterling sets a new low. Then it trickles higher, and then we get to the August BOE or the uh, July BOE meeting. BOE says, "Hey guys, rate cuts are coming," and then it goes right back down. And then we get an actual uh, another another BOE meeting. They go really dovish. They tease that a bazooka of stimulus might be coming. Another higher low. We actually get the bazooka of stimulus right here. It can't even set a new low. Notice we're just riding on this trend line. Now, what gave us this break, and this was something I didn't expect, I don't think I could have expected it, was the news that a hard Brexit scenario might be coming up, um, might, might actually happen. Since then, matters in the sterling have not been the same. It's kind of like the perfect storm of weakness where you have uncertainty around Article 50, you have uncertainty around the Bank of England, and even when the Bank of England was going for deeper and deeper monetary policy cuts, they were saying we could do more, we could do more, we could do more, so there's not much positive on that front either. It's like a perfect storm of weakness in a currency. But this morning, inflation began to show, albeit slightly above expectations. And now we're starting to see the sterling run higher. Now, where we're at right now, 23 and a quarter, is a prior swing resistance point right here from the high that we had on October 11th. 24 and three quarters, another interesting level right there, and then 25, of course, is the big figure. But we're still in flash crash territory. Okay, So this one is still in my no-fly zone. If it breaks above 23, 25, 23 and a quarter, that prior level of resistance, I may be able to begin lining this up for really short-term positions. And when I say really short-term, I mean like on the hourly or below so that I could look at a stop underneath the swing so that if I'm wrong, I get out quick. This is an extreme counter-trend position, even still, with this recent little bump of a couple hundred pips. But for now, until this thing puts in a more confirmed technical situation, it's my no-fly zone. And that, my friends, takes us to time. I uh, see there's a lot of good questions here. I'm going to run through these as quick as I can. Uh, if we saw dollar yen, uh, which we covered, DAX, US 30, uh, S&P, when you have some time. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, so spoos. I'm still in buy the dip mode on spoos. Uh, right in here. It's a pretty decent set in my mind. Um, you know, this chunky zone of resistance from last summer. Not coming in, showing some element of support. Now, all this said, long term, I'm not a huge stock bull. Valuations are just outlandish right now. Um, but I think at the moment, at least, the Fed is still somewhat in the driver's seat. Somewhat still in the driver's seat. Uh, as in, I feel like if this thing did get an ugly downside break, we would just hear from uh, multiple Fed members within a couple of days, hey, guys, we don't have to raise rates in November. We don't have to raise rates in December. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, once bitten, twice shy, right? Uh, that's what happened here after uh, China's Black Monday. It happened here after the four rate hikes in 2016 thing. It happened here after Brexit. You know, so this is still, in my mind, very much being managed by, uh, by central bankers. Um, so here it's by the dip, top side positions only for right now. Uh, if I do want to take a short equity stance, well, I have, and, and I still am, in the DAX. And, uh, you know, the way this one looks depends on the day that you ask me. Um, 
but you know, basically my logic here is, is kind of similar to what we were looking at a little earlier on the dollar yen, trying to use a couple different time frames to set this thing up. So to my eyes, if I'm going to short equities, uh, European equities, are, uh, that's where I want to go. Um, and, and what makes this really interesting to me is this, this long-term Fib observation. Like if we take the German expansionary move uh, after the wall fell, taking the 1991, 1990, 1991 low, draw that up to the tech boom high in March 2000. The 618 extension of that move was a pretty good job of catching that top in April of last year. And, you know, again, you know, since April of last year, things really haven't been the same um, on the DAX. Got some aggressive downside moves, been putting in some lower highs. It hasn't been, you know, a completely bearish scenario. We've seen some you know, aggressive dip buying coming in here. Now, I thought that we had what was going to be a good trend line, like right in here. Didn't pan out. Broke above, but it looks like we're catching some resistance in this little. I mean, it's got a slightly negative slope. There you go. You get a better idea for that right there. Yeah, there's nothing there. Uh, but yeah, this is the one that I'm looking at for short equity themes at the moment. Just given that we have some, you know, uh, semblance of technical topping patterns. Uh, they're showing up here. Uh, I have something similar on the CAC as well. Uh, this is a really long-term wedge, but you know, if you cut this back to uh, this top right here in uh, October 2000, connect to this top, June 2007, good projection, great ride. Um, we've had a couple of further tests here in June of this year on the support level of the trend line. You know, so this thing's wedging up, and it's and it's going to break at some point, but this thing has a few years before that wedge fills out. Um, let's see which other one. Uh, Dow Jones. Yeah, I don't have anything on Dow right now. Um, nothing that I'm a huge fan on. You know, it's a very similar kind of supported old resistance uh, type of type of theme, right? Right in here. It's just that it hasn't um, been as clean with that old level of resistance, right? Because we had this point up here. And the Dow just dove right through that early portion of September, where from the spoos was a little more eloquent. A little more eloquent. You know, we had this whole grouping of resistance points in here that give me a slightly better feel for support or resistance. A uh, guy asking a uh, dollar peso, please. So I know there's a lot of folks looking at this as like a you know presidential proxy type of deal. Ooh, nice move down to a trend line today. Um, you know, I'm real careful with, with uh, trying to trade correlated themes. You know, I try to limit as many of those uh, situations or positions where I'm, you know, where I could possibly uh, be right and still lose. All right, there's something going on here. Let's just start from this, from this level here. Not a great trend. Line, not a great trend line in there. Yeah, maybe something in there. Uh, most recent major move right in here. All right, so just going by near near term text, I don't I don't really have a lot that I could play with. I mean, this zone right down here, like eighteen to eighteen twenty, you know, that could have something because we have these two different two different swing points, like right in here. Um, this is not a strong enough swing point for me to want to react to. Uh, this trend line isn't great either. I only have two points of touch, and I don't have any symmetry with anything else. It felt like there was something in here somewhere. I just couldn't find it. You know, maybe if I get some more time to it, I might be able to find a trend line in there, but. Uh, None that's immediately available to me. Oh no, that one seems pretty good actually. But neither here nor there because we've already broken below it. Uh, so yeah, I'd watch this little kind of zone between 1820 and 18, maybe 179. See if I get a support point in there. You know, something along those lines. Uh, with a trend this strong, I'd really want to be. I'd be very trepidatious about looking at anything fade, uh, looking at anything short. I would want to be in a 
in like a bid only type of stance here, um, looking for like a deep discount type of play. If I could get something to run down and catch one of these deeper support points. All right, guys, I'm completely out of time. I have to cut it for today. I uh, just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for your time. I will be back on Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we're going to be talking some price action, and this is going to be in the wake of the ECB meeting, so hopefully we'll have some usable information from uh, out of Europe to work with. But uh, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. Uh, any questions that you want to answer that I wasn't able to get to today, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. I'm more than happy to help with whatever I might be able to. Um, I try to be as helpful as possible even on the uh, limited medium of 140 characters. But I'm going to put my uh, Twitter handle there in the chat box right now. And like I said, any questions you have, throw them my way. I'll do my absolute best to help you out. But folks, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, happy trading.